One of the main foci of our center is to really stimulate critical dialogue with the community, um, scholars, and just pretty much everybody that has a stake in higher education. And so this program today is one of the flagship activities of our center when it comes to um, sparking critical and productive, hopefully, dialogue about the purposes of higher education in the state of Wisconsin and abroad. And so before I hand it over to Matt and Bailey, I just wanted to thank the both of them for doing such a stellar job um, with limited resources and a limited amount of time. Um, and I wanted to thank all the students for hanging out with us and putting in some time last summer, going throughout the state, talking with people, and doing a fantastic job. Um, and I'm confident that the products out of this activity are going to really be a contribution to the debates about public higher education, which are getting more and more polarized, unfortunately. They're getting more and more important. Um, this week, there's a whole lot happening right now. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bailey and Matt. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, and thank you for supporting this research. Thanks, everybody, for being here. It's, it's so exciting um, to kind of see the culmination. Um, a lot of effort, a lot of work. Um, uh, as Matt said, my name is Bailey Smolark, and I'm an assistant researcher with the center. And um, I'm going to introduce to you my co-facilitator, Matthew Park Wolfram. Um, and I wanted to kind of just tell you how this project began. Um, about a year ago, we were kind of just discussing this as an idea, as wouldn't it be cool if we um, provided undergraduate students a stipend to come together, learn qualitative research skills, and create um, an educational research study looking at how people in Wisconsin thought of the purposes, goals, and aims of higher education. Um, and we saw this project as a way to engage undergraduate students with higher education issues through our expertise as social scientists. We also saw this as a way to collaborate with undergraduate students and learn more about the issues from their perspectives. And then as Matt mentioned, we saw this also as a way to fulfill one of the um, mission goals of the center to highlight student voice. Um, and we feel that all too often, decision making about college education doesn't really involve college students. And we felt that that was a mistake. And we feel that undergraduate students are often underestimated in their ability to investigate educational issues and advocate for their educational wants and needs. Um, and in the project we're presenting today, we wanted to recognize the unique vantage point of college students when, when looking at these issues of higher education by making them the researchers. Um, and over the past seven months, this really wonderful group of undergraduate students that you'll get to meet in a second um, have examined the very basic yet complex question of what's the point of higher education. And they've done this by going out to communities throughout Wisconsin, throughout in their own communities and engaging them in these discussions. And they've used their unique lens as college students to analyze the data. So um, we're really excited to share with you this work. And I'd also like to introduce our discussants for today, um, Dean of the School of Education, Dr. Diana Hess, and Professor of Political Science and um, expert on political ideology in Wisconsin, Dr. Kathy Kramer. Welcome, and thank you again for coming. I'd like to start off our presentation today um, by a question. How do Wisconsin residents view the purpose of higher education? And to kind of illustrate and begin on a humorous note, um, I've included a comic um, that kind of displays some of the conflict within uh, modern higher education that relates to our research. Um, if you can't read the comic, it shows Socrates going into a career counselor's office, reading his resume, and the career counselor says, sorry, but I don't see anything useful here given today's economy. Um, so I think, and then the newspaper on the table says, are the humanities majors failing in college? So as I introduce our project, kind of consider this ironic situation, maybe consider if you um, agree with this or not, or if you ex experience this in your own life. So uh, we began our research with, by reviewing the uh, 
history of higher education in the United States, and specifically in Wisconsin. We started with the foundation of higher education in Wisconsin through the Morrill Land Grant Act, uh, specifically the Act of 1862, which established the University of Wisconsin as a uh, land grant university, uh, which was ideally meant to uh, dedicate liberal and practical education of its citizens. And uh, Wisconsin statutes established the important connection between the university and the state government, as you can see in that quote. Um, the university system should be located at or near the seat of state government. And related to this uh, is the longstanding history of the Wisconsin idea, the philosophy that education should influence people's lives beyond the boundaries of the classroom. And the Wisconsin idea has a lasting legacy in public service, important enough to name this room after. We are in the Wisconsin idea room, um, so there is some lasting legacy there. Additionally, uh, Nick Stroll, who is here today, uh, came and talked to us on the Truman Commission and on, on higher education in 1946, which called for a national reexamination of higher education in light of the social role higher education has to play in a healthy democracy. Um, and it was published as Higher Education for American Democracy in a six volume report. And it established ideas such as uh, a network of community colleges as well as federal aid and grants to students. During this review, we saw two primary perspectives on the aims of higher education emerging. We saw higher education as a means of acquiring a liberal education and higher education as a means of vocational training. Shown above um, is, some, is a rough comparison of the key points that distinguish these two perspectives. As uh, Matthew said, our, we kind of saw these being increasingly polarized, so we wanted to kind of tease out these two perspectives. It's really important here, however, to stop and mention that these two perspectives are not the only uh, ideologies of the aims of higher education and, and um, there's not necessarily an emphasis of one or the other. They're not mutually exclusive, but we did see this trend emerging in all of our literature review, and we thought it was important to take note of that. A recent example of this is how the aims of higher education are politically positioned in our state uh, government. This is an excerpt of um, proposed edits to Wisconsin statutes by Governor Scott Walker's office here in Wisconsin. These edits were proposed um, not not passed, but proposed in uh, 2015. As you can see, these edits highlight the Walker administration's emphasis on the vocational aspects of higher education. And um, they proposed adding the section to meet the state's workforce needs, uh, which reflects that kind of vocational attitude. And these edits also removed some of the language that more directly uh, addresses the goals of the liberal education like the phrasing to extend knowledge beyond the boundaries of campus um, in the broad mission of public service and improving the human condition. So as you can see, there's sort of a paradigm shift in uh, that's reflected in these document edits here. However, um, it's important to note that there is political opposition to this idea. Our state senator, John Erpenbach, said, um, I really believe that the government the governor has lost his bearings as to who he is and what he does. His job is not to re rewrite the Wisconsin idea, it's to promote the Wisconsin idea. And this was um, published uh, in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Reviewing the literature and doing preliminary research for this study, we assumed that Wisconsinites might also see the aims of higher education as heavily politicized. We wondered, are the aims of higher education as politically divisive as they seem from our literature review, and as one might expect from news and media recently? And if so, do Wisconsinites also fall into these perspectives of vocational um, and liberal arts aims of higher education? If so, do their ideas of these two things overlap, and what socio-demographic factors influence that? And if one individual emphasizes one aim of higher education, does that imply that they do not agree or recognize other aspirations of higher education? Not to spoil the surprise of our conclusion, but we found that while opinions on higher education policy can certainly be politically determined and divisive, many Wisconsinites recognize that higher education has multiple levels of impact on society 
and that emphasizing certain factors of higher education doesn't necessarily exclude the value of others. So I'll hand it over to my colleagues. So Bailey and Bapp set out to construct a diverse team of student researchers with a specific group dynamic in mind. They wanted a group that spoke of all different experiences and came from different communities. They also specifically wanted all of us to be engaged with the research and to form relationships with each other. We worked alongside Bailey and Matt for every step of the research process. We were all responsible for engaging in the larger discussion because all of our ideas and opinions were valid. We were all seen as equals and everyone needed to contribute to truly make this project successful. This unique status of ours as student researchers allowed us to feel ownership of this project and wouldn't. And instead of just completing menial tasks for a project we perhaps didn't really understand and wouldn't think about the next semester. We were also all required to complete city training and were approved by the IRB, so we knew what was ethical and how to go about this kind of qualitative research. Because of the great responsibility and freedom given to us by Matt and Bailey and the required training, we all started this project with curiosity, passion, pride, and determination. Over the course of this project, we offered a total of six group workshops. We've also all met in smaller teams or with meetings with Matt and Bailey throughout the research process. The first workshop took place over two days where we focused on gaining background knowledge on higher education in general and other studies that were done in Wisconsin on higher education. We were, we were required to read numerous articles that discussed aims of higher education in Wisconsin, the history of higher education, different types of higher education like vocational training in tribal colleges, and tuition changes. We also learned about Kathy Kramer's study done on rural politics, so we had a feel for how rural Wisconsinites felt about public higher education. And we also heard from a guest speaker, Nick Stroll, um, at this workshop. He discussed with us the history of aims of higher education in America. Numerous shifts have occurred throughout the history of higher education, but we were all most intrigued by the shift from higher education being for personal enrichment to being about getting a job and advancing in society. Perhaps because this is often how I, higher education is framed today. During this workshop, we spoke with each other in large and small groups to begin to lay the groundwork for our research design. After a lot of discussing, we came together with three research questions. One, what do Wisconsinites see as the aims of higher education in the state? Two, how do participants' lived experiences, social background, and educational history influence their views of higher education in the state? And third, how are the aims of higher education politically <coughs> positioned and communicated? We are interested in how aims of higher education were seen by the Wisconsin population after discussing the aim shift with Nicholas Roll. We are curious to see if this proved to be true among Wisconsinites or if perhaps another shift was occurring. Did Wisconsin residents feel that higher education was for the purpose of getting a job, or did they feel that higher education was better for personal enrichment? Perhaps it was a combination of these two ideas or something different altogether. We were also interested in how demographic information played a role in the views of higher education because we were interested to see if there were any patterns in thought across the state. Lastly, we were curious to see how the aims of higher education were spoken about in terms of political language because of Kathy Kramer's study. We were eager to see how higher education was politicized in a more informal discourse. Would it follow the broad historical and societal trends, or would higher education be less politicized in this format? Recruitment procedures were community-based, so we were all forced to think critically about those who live in our communities. It could have been really easy for us to speak with the people we interact with every single day, but typically we were surround ourselves with people who are similar to us. We wanted to talk to people in communities who think differently than we do. We wanted people from all backgrounds, ages, experiences, genders, and races. We heard from participants in all different occupations, from small business owners to teachers to nurses. And although not documented, we were generally aware of the political affiliations of our participants due to our established connections. Participants fell all along the political spectrum. It was important to us to speak with different people with different experiences because it made our sample more well-rounded and allowed us to hear the opinions of people who are not middle-class white college students. Hearing the same thoughts 40 times over from people who are all relatively similar would not be helpful in terms of gaining the scope of what Wisconsinites really think about higher education. We were all responsible for recruiting five participants from our communities for a combined total of 40 participants. During this recruitment process, we all learned the importance of polite persistence. 
We often had to consider if asking someone for an interview four times was rude or if the person was just busy. People were often hesitant to participate, too busy to get back to us right away, or perhaps even too busy for an interview. But because of the personal relationships we had with most of the participants, it was easy to, to interview people. We were persistent and reliant on already developed connections, so this recruitment, recruitment process went more smoothly than seeking out people with whom we had no established rapport. As Cassidy mentioned, our sample consists of 40 individuals currently residing in Wisconsin, with each student researcher handpicking five individuals from his or her respective community. A requirement of our research was that our participants must have been settled in Wisconsin, so we have people who grew up in places from Montana to Laos to Mexico, but who now strongly identify as Wisconsinites. For demographics, our sample was, as you can see, relatively representative of race in Wisconsin. However, the team has agreed that in future studies, it would be both beneficial and interesting to conduct a study solely on minorities to obtain a better analysis and representation of minorities and their perspectives. The vast majority of our participants attended some type of higher education institution, with UW-Madison garnering a high number, but other UW system campuses, other Wisconsin colleges, and out-of-state colleges combining for well over half of higher education experiences. Gender was perfectly split down the middle, and we had a strong number of voices from um, all environments, including urban, rural, and suburban. We found a gap in representation of ages of late 20 to 30 year olds, but our sample otherwise has a wonderfully extensive spread of ages, from a few 20 year olds all the way to an octogenarian. With 40 participants, we gathered a great amount of information and ideas, but the sample still has limitations. First of all, it's small. 40 people could not ever represent all of Wisconsin. As aforementioned, we could benefit from more of a voice from minorities and people living in inner city environments. We recognize the fact that we researchers are all in college, and this may have influenced the participants to respond more favorably towards higher education in general than if we were not in higher education institutions. Along the same lines, reaching out within our communities meant we often already have established rapport with those in our circles, and this could have influenced how they responded to us. However, in spite of this familiarity, or perhaps because of it, we found that participants generally had no problem voicing their concerns with higher education. For interviewing participants, we obtained their consent in participating and used pseudonyms throughout the entire research process to maintain confidentiality. We recorded the interviews and made notes, and then transcribed them to have the content accurately documented for analysis. Once we described, we went over our own five interviews with great attention to detail and independently picked out recurring themes and ideas. From that information, we wrote memos from our interviews to synthesize the most widespread <coughs> and interesting ideas found. We then read and referenced the other researchers' memos, and the lead researchers composed a comprehensive list of posts from our interviews. From our memos. Using these explicit posts, we worked in pairs to comb through our interviews and quote our transcripts, marking every instance of an idea or quote that fit that quote. This information ultimately defined the themes we created based on the responses. Findings themes were split into two categories, AIMS findings and who and who findings. The AIMS findings focused on civic and community engagement, the Wisconsin idea, employment, critical thinking and interpersonal skills, personal growth and enrichment, and social mobility. The who and who findings focused on community suggestions, affordability, colleges for, university funding, and generational differences. We worked in groups to sift through all the ideas and quotes that were brought up from coding to choose representative quotes and gather data based on these subgroups within each broad category. Looking at the aims of higher education specifically here, this graph shows how many participants mentioned each idea that we found. The highest responses were that higher education is to gain employment with 28 out of 40 participants mentioning that, and to gain, gain civic and community engagement as noted by 29 participants. As you can see, the Wisconsin idea, as I'll describe later, was closely tied with civic and community engagement, and this may explain why the Wisconsin idea is the lowest here on the graph. So now we're gonna go into each aim in depth and describe them. 
In terms of civic and community engagement, uh, this is a popular aim stated by 73% of our participants. And um, as this graphic shows here, we defined this as becoming informed citizens, participating in democracy, and giving back to one's community after higher education. Participants express that this creates a more well-rounded society for all of them. In relation to democratic participation specifically, uh, one example that captured this idea well was when a participant whose pseudonym is Zane says that knowledge from higher education could, quote, help the government make better decisions and to be a good citizen, obeying laws, taking care of yourself, voting, making sure our democracy isn't undermined. Others also felt that becoming more culturally aware, like the theme of personal enrichment that will be described very shortly, inform citizens who should participate in democracy. Most commonly, civic and community engagement was connected to the ideas of giving back to one's community. This was often assumed that students have an obligation to, as mentioned by Jim, quote, owe something back to the world, the community, the university, because it's bigger than them. This kind of proves the implicit idea that higher education is a privilege, and those who go should help people who are less fortunate in their lives. The concept of giving back was noted by individuals from varying backgrounds in parts of Wisconsin, exemplifying the importance of community <coughs> by many different interviewees. Notions of community were additionally present in statements about the economic benefit to an area when, an individual are, when individuals are educated, and this is directly connected to the theme of employment, which we will discuss shortly as well. Specifically, in relation to the Wisconsin idea, this blended really well with the ideas of community and civic engagement. And this was mentioned explicitly by 18% of our participants, whether they knew it was called the Wisconsin idea or not. And just a reminder, we defined this as applying one's acquired knowledge to benefit the state and beyond, and to connect citizens to the University of Wisconsin system through both outreach and education. And as noted, this value has been in place for many generations. So when looking at our findings, uh, three subcategories emerge under the Wisconsin idea. The first being the value of educated individuals who can connect back to their community and then improve their local economy. And this relates to the aim of employment, which mentions that um, basically the Wisconsin idea is designating where this employment should happen, back into their communities. So students should be able to, as stated by Alex, quote, find meaningful work in Wisconsin and bring their knowledge and skills back to their hometowns. So I actually interviewed Alex, who's from a small town in northeastern Wisconsin, and he currently lives in Green Bay. And he has observed rural areas struggling to find skilled workers, especially in trade fields, which explains his desire here to have educated individuals return home. Uh, but it's import important here to recognize the complexity of participants. Other interviewees who are from both rural and urban areas express similar ideas of graduates returning home to improve their old community. Secondly, we found that the Wisconsin idea was connected to university research. Jim says research in higher education can lead to, quote, advancement of human knowledge, exploring the edges of fields, acquiring new understandings, new techniques. And this idea was connected that, that this is gonna benefit society as a whole with things like new medicines or new technologies coming out of research. And thirdly, there was the value between, of the relationship formed between higher education and citizens. Like with um, interviewees mentioned with professors being on public radio, certain agriculture outreaches, and similar work performed by UW Extension. So participants also expressed three general suggestions for higher education when specifically talking about <laughs> these two aims of community engagement and the Wisconsin idea. So the first was being that institutions should increase their outreach to citizens. One participant, Sam, would like higher education to quote, listen to citizens better, and then for them to provide opportunities for them to feel like they have a connection to whatever higher education organization they're interested in. 
all in an effort to build a higher level of trust between the citizen and the higher education. So this relationship is really important and impacts how people are going to perceive uh, the aims of higher education in Wisconsin. Thus, it's an important connection for you institutions to form. And secondly, we have a suggestion, some suggestions to um, have with the fear of um, losing talented and educated individuals after they graduate from rural areas, which is known as the brain drain. And this kind of res this may result in declined economic prospects or limited diversity in certain <coughs> small towns in Wisconsin, which may already be struggling. And like the Wisconsin idea and community engagement aims, um, participants emphasize instilling values of community specifically back to one's own hometown. And then thirdly, a suggestion was to reduce the disconnect between policy and practices of higher education institutions. In relation to the Wisconsin idea of providing access and higher education for all citizens, some participants like James felt that this philosophy, quote, seems to have gone away tremendously. Others cite certain things like admissions criteria, costs, and supports in schools as limits to the Wisconsin idea. The next aim I will talk about is employment. 70% of participants discussed employment in their interviews. Despite how widely it was referenced, there is wide variation in how participants talked about the relationship between higher education and employment. So up here, uh, this talk quote, on one end of the spectrum, we have uh, Griffin who says, you are almost guaranteed a job if you got a degree no matter what. On the other hand, uh, this quote in the bottom right uh, by Frank, who's a recently graduated engineer, he says, I am less convinced that a college education equals a job right out of college. Other participants fell somewhere in the middle and can be represented by this middle quote by Tony. Even with a college education, you are not guaranteed a good job that you went to school for, but you are better off having a degree than not. Even though there was this variation in how participants perceived the relationship between higher education and employment outcomes, there were several commonalities in how participants described higher education's influence on employment. One common theme was the idea that higher education creates job flexibility, or what participants defined as the ability to obtain a variety of jobs and advance one's career. Participants thought that higher education creating job flexibility was particularly important in a society with increasingly high-tech industries. Another common theme was that higher education can impact employment through the role in assisting with social networking. And this is via counselors, professors, clubs, organizations, and internships. Lastly, participants emphasize that higher education can influence employment through directly preparing students with the skills they need for a specific job. Participants suggested the promotion of trade schools and other hands-on programs to teach students specific skills in preparation for a career. For example, Jane recommended promoting programs such as certified nursing certificates and integrating these programs with high school. It was interesting because in many cases, the same participants who promoted this type of vocational education simultaneously advocated for a broad liberal arts education with an emphasis on this concept of critical thinking, uh, which I will talk about next. So another aim of higher education that was identified is to foster critical thinking and interpersonal skills. The term critical thinking was recurrently brought up by participants and deemed to be important. However, no one participant alone gave a precise definition of what critical thinking is. We looked at the collection of interviews to develop a common definition across all participants. The collective definition of critical thinking is the ability to understand, listen, and discuss different ideas and perspectives. Despite its importance across many interviews, there was a concern over higher education not teaching critical thinking. <clears throat> In addition to critical thinking skills, many participants discussed how college can provide interpersonal skills by giving students the opportunity to interact, work, and communicate written and verbally with different people. A participant, Zane, placed emphasis on the importance of learning compassion and kindness and how this is essential to working with others. In summary, both interpersonal and critical thinking skills deserve particular attention in higher education. 
and participants encourage further promotion of multi-perspective debate, working together, and being exposed to a variety of ideas and classes uh, in order to promote these particular skills in higher education. Throughout our research to document the aims of higher education throughout the state of Wisconsin, our research team found that participants found higher education to be a way to personally enrich their lives and offer a time to engage with new people and new subjects. The comments our participants gave were able to be broken down into three main categories that I'll touch upon throughout my part of the presentation, and those are the value of well-roundedness, cultural awareness, and self-development. Those who pursue higher education have the ability and opportunity to become more well-rounded. One way this is achieved is taking a wide variety of classes, for example, which can be defined as a liberal arts education, and that can encompass both qualitative and, quali qualitative and quantitative um, classes that were touched upon before. One participant who valued the way of a liberal arts education to become more well-rounded is Rachel. Rachel is a teacher I interviewed so I believe she offers some valuable insight into the education field. She believes if you learn about topics such as architecture, music, if you learn about geology and art, the knowledge and skills that you gain from taking those classes can be related back to experiences you already have and experiences you could have in the future. For example, she says if you take an art class during higher education and go to an art museum, You'll enjoy it more if you understand it more. It's this type of education and the ability to make connections with your experiences that will ultimately make you a more well-rounded individual. Having more understanding can also increase cultural competence, which is another part of personal enrichment and engagement that our participants mentioned. It's important to note that our participants found cultural awareness to extend beyond just the um, idea of race. It's also about encompassing different lifestyles and those who live in different parts of our own country as well. Exposure to these new cultures and ways of life, as one participant whose pseudonym is Maj pointed out, forces you to look outside your bubble. Maj goes on to say that this exposure can solidify or change your opinion but it's vital that you've had this, this exposure during higher education to begin with. And overall, participants found that they agreed with Madge's statement about um, looking outside your bubble during higher education. We can look outside your bubble on the side. Here you are in the middle, and around you are topics that I've already discussed, such as new opinions, cultures, people, and new subjects that you can be exposed to during your time in higher education. And this is how you increase your self-awareness during higher education. Interacting with all these factors can also help you realize what your strengths and weaknesses really are. For example, I interviewed one participant whose pseudonym is Adam, who said, during higher education, hopefully you had to face all different types of people and hopefully you've had some adversity in the four years and find out you can't always get your way. Another participant, Anne, believes that there should be more emphasis on teaching students to be introspective enough to recognize what their strengths and weaknesses really are and to help them decide what, they, what and who they'd like to be both during higher education and after. Overall, these discussions and aspects truly show the personal roots and opportunities <coughs> higher education provides, and overall, higher education can offer time to personally enrich yourself. There are also socioeconomic roots associated with higher education, and 12 of our participants highlighted an aim of higher education to be accessing social mobility. Wisconsinites could use this education to remove various socioeconomic barriers or even themselves physically from poor and desolate neighborhoods throughout the state of Wisconsin. Although participants saw higher education as a way to move up the social ladder, not everyone has this social, social mobility. 
One participant who goes by Jim believes that this immobility needs to be combated. To take a sample from his thoughts, he believes that there are brilliant minds throughout the state of Wisconsin. But because they come from poverty and they associate with peers who have very counterproductive behaviors that they then fall into, there's a great waste of human capital. Because of this, the state and university can't benefit from their human capital, which can be defined as a set of both intangible and tangible knowledge and skill set. These students can't leverage their own human capital as well by not having some of the same possibilities and opportunities outside of higher education. And overall, that's a great waste. Another time this potential could have been wasted and when students could have been hindered from using higher education for social mobility is during high school advising. One participant whose pseudonym is Jane recounted a time her high school counselor told students from either poor or minority student populations that they were simply not college material and to not bother applying to certain schools based on their background. In situations like these, students don't have the chance to utilize higher education to benefit themselves on the social ladder. Some, fortunately, were encouraged to pursue higher education as a way for social mobility early on in life. One of the best examples of this is the conversation I had with Mark. Mark's father was a dump truck and cement truck driver. And his father encouraged Mark to go on to higher education and get his degree so he didn't turn out like his father. So Mark could have a better life and not end up pouring cement for a living. So that's what Mark did. He pursued a higher education and got his degree got involved in extracurriculars to enhance his college experience and ultimately became the success that his father has hoped for today. Now, Mark is working in the communications field instead of pouring cement. Reflecting back, Mark said that higher education ultimately can change a family's narrative, provide an opportunity for people to better themselves and change somebody's life. This truly shows us the social power higher education has. So in addition to discussing aims of higher education in Wisconsin, participants also discussed barriers to pursuing and succeeding in higher education. These barriers included both affordability or the financing of higher education, as well as accessibility to higher education before and during college. 28 out of 40, or 70% of participants mentioned concerns with higher education funding and affordability. Within this group, eight participants explicitly discussed costs as a barrier that prevented students from accessing or easily completing higher education. Two participants said that the affordability barrier was the factor that prevented them personally from attending higher education. Others saw affordability as a barrier that did not make, it, make attending higher education impossible, but it did make it much more difficult to complete. For these participants, this barrier could be overcome by working while attending school, loans, or other sacrifices. Moreover, several participants expressed concern that the generational difference of increasing costs of higher education could make it more difficult for students to overcome this affordability barrier. To combat affordability, one suggestion participants had was increasing the awareness of scholarships. So looking beyond uh, just finances, we also had 25% of participants felt that students need more resources in high school to access higher education. So one of our most common proposals under this was for increased counselors to assist students with things like college applications, scholarships, and career assistance. Older participants we found recognized that there has been an increase in high school's preparation of students, but still called for further help. One participant, Kathy, says that, quote, high school counselors are overworked and understaffed, so I don't think students get as much individualized attention as they deserve to or would like to have in regards to their college search. I also interviewed Kathy, and she's currently a college senior right now and was reflecting back on her high school experience from a student perspective here. 
This shows that even as a student, she could see that just a few years ago, counselor support was greatly needed. So it was understood that the process of getting into higher education is a very complex process and a barrier to many students without the proper support that a high school counselor can provide, no matter the type of institution they are looking to go into. Another suggestion and that sometimes was a barrier for students was they wanted more apprenticeships and partnerships between high schools and technical colleges. This connects previously to the mentioned Wisconsin idea and ideas that other participants have about UW Extension. And this partnership can provide real world experience for these individuals and can help one decide a future career path, which will ultimately save them time and money. Overcoming barriers doesn't necessarily stop when students access higher education and as they strive for that graduation date. Mental health can be particularly challenging for students when they deal with new stresses of academics or perhaps having to live on their own for the first time. One participant who goes by Olivia said, a lot of times you're still an adolescent struggling through the world. And Olivia goes on to say that it's these type of mental struggles that can cause some students to even drop out at points. Students could still use the same amount of support and the structures they had in high school and in other lived experiences. Support for disabled students is also lacking throughout our college system. Disabled students face barriers of having to navigate our campuses physically on a day-to-day -day level and also face the challenge of being able to pass classes and graduate successfully on time. First generation college students and students from minority backgrounds also face barriers at state higher education institutions. Jane says, for example, don't pick somebody from inner city Kenosha and set them up for school, set them up for failure, but instead provide a cohort going through and getting support for unexpected things like book fees or travel abroad. It is these barriers that hinder student accessibility during higher education in Wisconsin. As mentioned earlier, um, throughout our introduction, we looked over the politically emphasize debate between what higher education really means and what it means to the aims. Some people, such as W.E. Du Bois, mentioned the liberal outlook of it being for fulfillment and broadening your mind, as well as vocational outlook of what Reagan mentioned, which meant advancing a career or an ideal way to move up socioeconomically. We also saw how Governor Scott Walker proposed making amends to the Wisconsin statute of either adding in to meet the state's workforce's needs or deleting words such as extending knowledge and its application beyond the boundaries of its campus. For these, we found in our findings that actually our participants think of it as more of a broadening outlook, a more broadening horizon. We depolarize from these very polarized and political outlooks of what higher education is. Our eclectic aims and our findings suggest that actually our participants think that yes, it does go towards what employment interprets to, but also participants believe that self-enrichment is an aim of higher education, such as personal growth, finding your identity and becoming well-rounded, social mobility, moving up the socioeconomical ladder, civic engagement of voting and knowing your rights, obeying laws, such as community engagement, of giving back to your, so, to your local community, as well as the Wisconsin idea, applying knowledge to benefit the state. Our findings suggest that participants actually have more of an eclectic vision of the aims of higher, higher education than our politically polarized policy debate. As mentioned, the barriers of higher education that our participants mentioned were affordability, pre-college and academic advising, 
lack of support for minorities and first-generation students, lack of support for mental health and disabilities. And these barriers, we would like to recommend as a research team that administrators and policymakers should review their aims and barriers of these participants to reflect the budget of what they invest into the um, budgets that they make, um, as well as public universities should engage in outreach and they should exemplify these eclectic aims to build a relationship with citizens, such as budget transparency. Here we see Alex, he says, I don't know the inside dealings of where the money is being spent by the schools. I don't know exactly what the college teachers actually get paid. In this sense, he doesn't really know what's going on with the budget. So in order to create a strong relationship between public universities and the citizens of Wisconsin, it's, imp it's important to make a budget transparency of where, where the money goes and where it's invested into. As mentioned earlier, for future studies, we would like to conduct a study that focuses more on underrepresented communities, such as minorities and first-generation students. This study that we did is representative of the demographic of Wisconsin, however, it doesn't represent as well um, to better serve the populations of minorities or students of color. I guess my comments and questions are, I can lump into two parts. One on your methods, which I have a real affinity for, you know, and also on your findings. So um, one thing I, I guess I should start off by saying with respect to your methods is that your results and the way you went about your work and how you talk about them just go to show just how important listening to people is these days, right? And what an important set of skills that is to be able to go to people where they live and sit down with them and listen to their thoughts and their concerns. And you could hear in just even in the brief bits of your interviews you shared with us that the hunger that there is for people to be listened to. So I wanna applaud you on that. We, we often, I mean, in our own daily lives, we don't have time to do this, right? And so much of the way we communicate with one another is not oriented around listening. It's instead about pushing information out there. So thanks for the reminder to us all just how important it is. Um, a few other things with respect to your methods. I loved your recruitment method of trying to reach beyond the usual people in your social networks. Um, I, and I guess one quick question for you is, so each of you was doing, you were each doing work in your hometowns, is that right? Or did you, some of you picked certain Wisconsin communities and then you, you interviewed people within those? We all picked people from other hometowns and communities that we just associate with okay. campus or across the state. Okay, so kind of a mix. Okay, great. One thing I was struck by is it you did seem to get a wide range of people, but I think one group that was underrepresented was non-college folks, right, who we can probably imagine have a pretty different perspective on the value of college. And so... Um, that just means thinking about what kind of views might be missing here, and if you go do more work along these lines, I think it'd be worthwhile to talk with people who have decided to get different form of post-secondary education and folks who have decided not to get any at all. Um, and an but another thing I want to emphasize is your small sample, I would ask yourselves, what does that small sample get you? I mean, I, I do this in my own work where I, part of me wants to generalize and say what I have heard is representative of a broader population, but it's not really, right? We don't have any kind of confidence that what you heard kind of captures what people in Wisconsin or people in a broader population feel about higher education. But instead, what you give us is something really valuable that we don't get through public opinion polls. And that is the way people are thinking and interpreting higher education, the way they're putting things together. So some of the things that really stood out for me was um, when people were talking about employment, the other things that come up when they're talking about higher education and employment, and partly what you're teaching us about how when people think about going to college to prepare for a job, it's what they give us is, 
it's not just job skills, it's all this communication stuff as well, right, and interpersonal skills. And that, I mean, that very much resonates with Prof Professor Hora's research on what employers say that they want from college graduates. Like, yes, they, they want us to have technical skills, but almost uh, more often than that, more importantly than that, they want us to be able to communicate with one another, right, and to relate to people of a wide range of backgrounds. And that, as you so uh, great, <laughs> just uh, eloquently point out, that the political debate skims over that, right? It's, a, it's either job skills or becoming a better human. It, you know, you're showing in a great way. It's a mix of things. So I'm already getting it here um, into just some thoughts on your results, but um, I was very surprised by just how often um, the people you talked to emphasized uh, community engagement and civic skills. And part of that is, I think that's what really made me wonder about, would that sound differently among people who didn't go on to college? And um, so again, to not you know get too carried away about, well, not everybody, that's not representative of what people in general think about college, but your data can help us think about, when people mention community engagement and civic skills when they're talking about college, how does that come up, right? Is it, separate from employment considerations? Does it come up in conjunction with those things? Or is it something to do with the way you all introduced yourselves or this and the study? Do you know what I mean? Because it's that is not a common occurrence for people to talk about becoming a better citizen when they're thinking about college. Um, but I think it's, personally, I think it's a hugely important and it is something that's really important about a college degree. Oh, one question I did want to ask for you, and you, I, you decide whether you want to respond now or later on, but I'm very curious to hear what you learned, especially from your older respondents, about their recollections of the UW and the UW system, and sort of when people were talking about their concerns about affordability, right? I mean, I know in my own work, oftentimes it comes up, people would talk about the good old days when it was everybody could go and you know, you always landed a job. But I, I'm interested in how, um, because you have such a wide range of ages represented here, if it sounded different across people of different ages and the people who are older, their recollections of what the UW used to be like. So both about affordability, but also about this, the Wisconsin idea concept, right? And some people telling you it used to be there was all kinds of collaboration or outreach or whatever term they use for it. And I'm really intrigued by how people describe what it used to be like. The last thing I wanna share with you is, um, I would ask yourselves, when you encountered things in your interviews that you know to not be accurate or um, just not true, how you wanna, um, it's partially true, <laughs> what that tells you. Because sometimes when we come across those things in studies of public opinion, it means that we just discount what's being said but oftentimes those misconceptions tell us something about our society that we should pay attention to. The thing that stood out for me was in the findings with respect to social mobility. When there was this gentleman, gentleman talking about the waste of human capital, um, and this is not the, this is a paraphrase, but because people come from a culture of poverty and associate with peers with counterproductive behavior. I wonder about that, like, what does that tell us about our sense of people's ab ability to, to um, mobilize out of a uh, low income level of existence? Do you know what I mean? Um, I shouldn't end that by saying, but you, do you know what I mean? But I get what I mean is, Okay, there's, there's ways in which you could look at the data and say, yes, okay, that's the case. But that, that conception that the issue is a culture of poverty tells us something about the way we are thinking about each other and about our structures and our institutions and about higher education and opportunity. So you, you have shown us so much and taught us so much in these interviews. And 
I, uh, I know some of you are studying anthropology and your other majors. It sounds like these skills of listening will be important in your other courses, but I would just applaud you on taking the time to develop these skills now because regardless of what you go into, they're going to be so important. And in particular, with respect to our civic, <laughs> our civic skills in our political system. So thank you. It's a real honor. So I want to begin by thanking you. And I was thinking as I was listening to you that you have provided a great uh, case study that we can use to answer the question, what do people learn in higher education? So let's imagine we knew nothing about any of you except for what you demonstrated in 50 minutes. So what um, could we learn from that? Well, one thing that we could learn is that you have excellent communication skills. I mean, I was really struck by how well written your talks were, that they were written, that clearly you had really worked on this, and that they were delivered so expertly and so fluidly. And we know that very few people in contemporary America have communication skills like that. So that's one thing. And then you talked a little bit about not really knowing what critical thinking means. You know, this is a contested concept, as we say in the literature. Except I think we know a couple of pretty clear things, which is that people who can design an inquiry, which is what you did, and execute an inquiry have to have critical thinking skills to be able to do that. You have to be able to analyze, you have to be able to evaluate, you have to be able to make judgments, et cetera. So the second thing, in addition to communication skills, is you demonstrated that you have critical thinking skills. And then by the way that you talked about how you did this process, and by the even more interesting way in which you collaborated that you came up as with a partner. And so it was clear that you had worked to that extent that who was gonna help whom when you're giving each part of the presentation. It's clear that this was a group effort and that it was done as a group, that you did it collaboratively. And my hunch is that you probably believe that you couldn't have done this as well on your own as you did with a group. For one thing, it's not that far into the semester and you talked with 40 people. And you wouldn't have been able to do that if you were doing that as a singleton researcher. So the fact that you were able to pull off this um, project in a very short period of time, I must say, shows that you're able to collaborate and work well with a group. Now one question I would have is, do you think you could do that when you were seniors in high school? Or do you think that there's something about the experience you've had here at the University of Wisconsin that has helped you develop the skills that you need to do that? Or perhaps it's simply providing you the opportunity and the mentorship um, and the fact that you had people to guide you. And this is a huge question in the world of higher education. You know, everyone's trying to figure out what is it that we know about what higher education actually teaches compared to what is it that we know about the ability of higher education to select people who already have developed lots of good skills and to bring them into a place to all work together. I would like to think that you developed a lot of this while you were here, but I've got to say that it strikes me as really extraordinary, these skills because they're so unusual and they're so hard to develop. And it, I really thought about it as you were talking about what your participants said about the purpose or the aims of higher education. Because on the one hand, if I were in an employer role, which I am, I hire people all the time, I would say, this is fantastic. Look, we've got people who know how to write, they know how to communicate orally, they've gotten along with a group with no visible uh, signs of, of you know, horrible things happening, and they demonstrate all these critical thinking skills. This is great. This is exactly the kind of person that I want to have work on whatever it is I want that person to be engaged with. On the other hand, my hunch is that a lot of these skills also develop what Kathy has helped us understand so much, which is the ability to make really good decisions as citizens. So the kinds of questions that we're gonna have in front of us as we go into what we know is gonna be a raucous and very interesting primary season and then general election are really important questions. And one is how 
important is higher education to the state of Wisconsin. And what accounts for the fact that compared to so many other states, the number of people we have in this state who have experience with higher education is so low. And is that a problem? And to get to your third research question that I was really interested in, which is the political polarization around higher education, we know is relatively new. And it is increasing at a really rapid rate. So I think the latest poll results I saw, which were a lot less interesting than what you were able to find from your interview, suggest that the number, if we wanted just one question to ask people that would predict what they think about the value of higher edu education, we know what that question is, which is, who do you vote for? And that people who say they vote for Republicans are much, much more likely to say that higher education has limited value, that higher education should be recalibrated for vocational purposes, and that higher education in some ways is actually dangerous. So we're getting a lot of evidence now that people believe that higher education is something that is causing people to be indoctrinated into political views that are alien to their families, and that that's not a good thing. And if we ask people who you vote for and they say Democrats, they're much more likely to be supportive of higher education. And interestingly enough for the faculty in this room, they're much more likely to like faculty. Which, you know, we all want to be liked. So, that, you know, that <laughs> kind of makes for a harsh Thanksgiving if you've got a, you know, a politically heterogeneous family. So I think what I was interested in when I was listening to your presentation is just how what you've learned maps onto this other landscape that we're starting to understand. In other words, how does what you have done fit in with what we like to call the literature? So you did a really nice job at the beginning of saying, here's some things that we learned about the literature, here's some ways of framing this historic debate between vocational purposes and other purposes, and your questions were developed in part to really get at that and to go at that very specifically. And now what I'm interested in is what's the relationship between your findings and this larger literature? And if your findings are different, which I think they are with respect to political polarization, I mean, that is what strikes me as the big difference. Why is that? So is that that your sample, which is a great sample in many ways, is actually not a politically heterogeneous sample? Now you suggested that that's not the case, that you know these folks well enough to know something about their political views, and it seems like a heterogeneous group. So if that's the case, and you're pretty confident that that's true, then I would really be interested in that. I would want to go back to your uh, your transcripts and try to figure out what it is, what is it about this group that's so different than what we're seeing in other things that are coming out. And it may be that Kathy's point about methodology explains this, that people have complex views. If you ask somebody, for what reason do you want your kid to go or not go to college? My sense is that's not gonna be a one word answer. Right? People are going to say, well, you know, I, I really want them to come back to the community and give, give back. I'm really concerned about the brain drain. I don't want them to live in my basement, so they better get a job. You know, I'm concerned about the political situation, so I want to make sure that they know that it's important to vote and to be an informed voter. And they're saying all sorts of things. And that's very different than what you get to say when you ask a poll question that asks you something like, what is the number one reason why people should or should not go to college? And so I actually think the value of your research is that it makes the simple complex. And that is, I think, what we can gain from qualitative research. That being said, I was really struck by the same thing Kathy um, identified, which is it seems like even though there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of dispute about important questions, we actually do have evidence on some things. So it's not like everything's up for grabs. 
So if we ask the question, what's the relationship between higher education and social mobility? Or what's the relationship between higher education and political participation? Are you more likely to vote if you go to college? There's an answer to that, yes. And there's very little dispute about that. If there's a question about whether or not higher education is gonna lead you to be more economically secure, there's an answer to that, yes. If there's a question about are you going to live longer and be healthier if you have higher education, there's an answer to that, yes. So what's interesting is why is it that on the one hand, we've got some things that we've got really clear answers to, and yet we still have lots and lots of people who don't believe that to be true. And this is not unique to people's views about higher education. I mean, I think it was yesterday or the day before, the candidate for the Senate in Alabama very clearly said there's no such thing as evolution. I think we know that that's not true. And so I think it's very interesting to think about how you deal with this. And you certainly don't want to deal with it by saying, well, those people are just stupid. But I do think it can cause you to dig a little deeper, like one layer down in your transcripts to say, to ask another question, which is, for the people in our sample who don't believe things are true that we actually know are empirically warranted, what accounts for that? Because I think that in and of itself is kind of an interesting question. So let me end now just by saying that I thought this was an amazing presentation. And I took pages of notes. And I'm going to steal and cite what you've done. Because I'm in the process of writing a paper for the Mellon Foundation right now on the question of what's the relationship between liberal arts education and political participation. And it very unfortunately is due a week from Sunday. <laughs> and so now you've added to my list of things to think about a whole bunch of things. So for that, I thank you very, very much. Well, I agree with, with Professor Kramer and, and Dean Hess. This is, this is fabulous. I, I do some research in this area. Um, and you definitely came out with more nuanced answers uh, than a lot of the research out there. So I agree with both the professor and the dean. So congratulations. This has been very helpful to me as well. Um, I get one question I have is when I've conducted forums and, and, and focus groups around the state asking similar questions, when I went to areas where folks either had an edu higher education or they came from a regional university like a UW Green Bay or a technical college like a Northeast Technical College, I got very different answers, very different answers. And I was curious, I, I, I vaguely remember you had a, a graph up there of people who you interviewed who had a different educational background. I'm curious if you can recall, um, did you get that sense that someone who either had an affinity to a different type of a college or university, as well as someone who may have had a degree from a different type of institution, may have had more of a view on the aims of higher education? Um, I know, like, I understand you have 40 people that but that's a great start and you have something. So I'm just curious if you could recall something as it relates to who you talked to and the affinity they had with a different type of institution. So in terms of the methodology, right, we, um, um, so all sort of areas of the state are yeah. represented in the sample. Um, including that northeast area of the state that you mentioned, right. you know, so like the <laughs> kind of forested uh, um, resource extraction area of the state, uh, and then I, you know, the um, and then you saw this. You mentioned the slide of the, yeah. the different. So r only a few people didn't have any background in, in any kind of higher education, yeah. but there was the technical colleges, the uh, the community colleges, and the UW systems, and then a nice chunk of UW mixed background, either having graduated or currently. Okay. And um, I can say, from, from what I recall, um, I can say that uh, um, people in the rural areas really, um, you know, express a lot of affinity to their 
to their regional okay. educational institution and the UW Extension. And you know, one of the slides mentioned uh, mentioned that. So, yeah. um, does anybody else have any? I noticed like generally um, even with people who had attended UW Madison specifically um, and especially younger people and people concerned with the financial barriers that people overwhelmingly said you know despite whatever choice I made in higher education I think technical colleges and community colleges and other vocational programs are highly underrated and that more people need to consider it um, and I especially see this with young people who are uh, facing the choice between student debt and, um, you know, career mobilization. Do you remember uh, you had the slide up at the beginning of where the governor was going to rewrite the Wisconsin idea? Um, I don't know if you remember. There was an enormous backlash, and he had to back off. And I've been puzzled by that backlash I don't know, I didn't pay close enough attention to know where exactly it came from. But given the attacks of the legislature on us, given uh, what a lot of the people in Kathy's book say about the faculty and the university, I didn't expect a backlash to that that wasn't coming from here or people connected or been here. Did you get any information that would help explain why in general people are protective of the Wisconsin idea and didn't want it rewritten? You might not have, I, but I thought this was <laughs> finally an opportunity to find out if anybody understands this. I'll just say, I'll just respond generally that the, the, the just the general finding of the fact that so many so many of uh, the people that we interviewed uh, did support you know either either they knew about the Wisconsin idea but more likely they, they supported the idea of it and civic engagement uh, you know, which I discussed and mentioned this is kind of a surprising finding I guess that kind of speaks provides some of a context to your question because uh, that you know that broad sort of reaction to Truncating the vision of, of the university system could come from a kind of you know a general recognition of that we found of a more eclectic kind of roles of education. So it's kind of encouraging. Can I just add to it? I think it was really useful to hear how many of you um, encountered people talking about the Wisconsin idea, even though most Wisconsin aren't all familiar with that phrase, right? But it had that conception in mind when talking about higher ed. No, it, it just may be more of a widespread sentiment. Then. I hope it is. <laughs> and in terms of methodology, we should point out too that one of our questions that we asked about was community participation and the Wisconsin idea. So that might be why people mention community participation so much, which is one of the questions you brought up, and why people mention the Wisconsin idea, as well as how many people we had from UW Madison. Mm -hmm. But when they mentioned it, they know what it is. Like you had a great definition of the Wisconsin idea on your slide, and when you asked them a question that had that concept label, and listened to their answers, was it clear that they had the same conception that we normally think of around here? Yeah. We didn't define it for them. Yeah. Um, and I think overall, at least in the interviews that I worked closely with, people understood that. Um, but a lot of my participants were in the Madison area. So I'm not sure what other concerns. Who had the, there was somebody, who had the, the quote of uh, um, you know, advancement of science and so on that pushed the boundaries of knowledge? Who was, who was, oh, that? Was, was that, that was me, yeah, uh, okay. a local educator here in Dane County who is very, very, very left-leaning in political discourse and very opposed to the current administration, which is, I think, partially why, um, and he is a secondary education teacher that pushes kids to attend higher education, and I think that's why he's so familiar with down to the exact wording and really of the ideas. Um, so I interviewed people from more of a rural community and people who generally didn't have as much higher education experience or just a very little amount, and almost every person who I interviewed had some kind of phrasing of um, people should take the information that they gain in college and apply it to their lives or they should um, use it to benefit others. And so I think in almost every interview, people
people had that sentiment, but um, for me at least, there wasn't like the Wisconsin idea stated in it. But I think for most people, we had that kind of sentiment, and for a few people, of course, we mentioned it, but it was really prevalent. Yeah, we had. Oh, we didn't have that many participants that explicitly said Wisconsin idea, um, but we had the majority somehow say give back, whether that was give back to your state, give back to your community, give back to your whatever. Like that was very prevalent. Well, I'm curious to learn more about the third bullet that says public university, universities can engage in outreach to Wisconsinites about how their work advances these eclectic aims of higher education. Can anybody tell me a little bit more about that that I could take back um, to my colleagues that are in extension to either reinforce their work or give them some guidance from what you learned? So I guess what we were saying was that what we think is that um, public universities should engage more outreach because not a lot of people in Wisconsin really know um, what goes on with between administrators and what their, uh, their talks and the deliberations are. So in order to do that, we talked about being uh, budget transparency and being able to really um, show where the money goes to and where it's invested. And in this case, um, citizens can either advocate or um, decide if it's not fit. And they can have a voice out of like, with if they would like it or if they would not. Like, it would be a great opportunity to build a strong relationship between public universities and students and also the community itself. You know, I'll just add on. So like, there are these two, two things, like these two findings. One, uh, which as you mentioned, was like, uh, a lot of people don't understand how universities are funded and how people pay for their education. Okay, so they would, they would sort of communicate wrong information or just say like, I really don't get it. I don't understand how it works, uh, kind of mystified by it. So that was one thing. The other thing that we found was that uh, the things that we sort of educators think we should be doing, a lot of people in our sample agreed. You know, so so the idea of outreach is basically like let's let's outreach to to communities, uh, perhaps through the extension. I mean, that's, I think that would be wonderful, um, and basically say these are the things that we're doing, the eclectic a range of things that we're doing, and this is how we're paying. This is how we do. We pay for what we do, uh, and you know the indication from our research is that people would be receptive to like that outreach. Uh, so that, yeah, thank you. Good question. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting that even though you all did a project about higher education, K through 12 schooling came up, um, and it kind of begs the question of what is the role of universities um, in supporting K through 12 schools, um, especially schools that um, are underfunded, right, so they can't get more counselors. Um, but clearly there are some inequalities going on about who gets to know about college, um, who gets to know about a place like UW-Madison. And so um, just did any of your participants have, I know there were suggestions around more counselors, but anything more that they suggested? Like should UW be having more investment in that area? Or? I don't know if y'all recall it. Yeah, not necessarily from my participants, but I remember working with the data that um, at least one participant said that you should, in high school, is focus less on saying like, oh, if you go to college, this is how much you'll make in comparison of how much you could make if you didn't go to college, for example. Mm -hmm. But instead, put more emphasis on showing like, here's what the students are doing at our universities, here's what they're working on, here are the people they're working with, and I think just more exposure to that side rather than, you know, here's a poster of, you know, money, for example. That so, mm -hmm. there's more value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the yeah. college advice did come yeah. up too. Yeah. 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 Uh, Pre-college and college advice. And it seems like a lot of a lot of the participants mentioned that. Right? I mean, I think we had a lot on uh, secondary school advising to the point where like we almost weren't focused on that but it, it just bubbled up like you mentioned and um, like Ryan mentioned one of the things that I thought was really interesting is critiquing the perspective that secondary uh, career counselors sort of have on who should go into higher education and why mm -hmm. um, and like you mentioned there's this sort of like the typical angle that we agreed that we saw as well in high school was, you know, money, socioeconomic 
mobility mm -hmm. and other incentives like that, like vocationally uh, inspired ones, and not so much these other ideas that we were talking about. And so there's kind of an open discussion of like, you know, what should career counselors be telling kids and how should they be motivating them to make mm -hmm. the right decision? It's almost like a different part of the study, but like what are, what are the aims of higher education in high schools, right? Like yeah. what are, yeah. what are yeah. teachers yeah. and yeah. counselors mm -hmm. promoting? It, it almost sounds like it's, it's completely different from this like more liberal arts um, section. In addition to um, what we found in our studies, one of the participants of uh, my interviewees, um, he mentioned that his guidance counselor actually, because he's an immigrant from Laos, mm -hmm. and his guidance counselor actually told him that he probably shouldn't go into higher education because, um, because he couldn't really speak English, mm -hmm. and that was one of the barriers. And so, uh, going again with um, what guidance counselors should say and who should say who should go to higher education is a matter of talk of what's important for students to learn. 